Hi there, this is Matt Heffernan. Welcome back to my channel. This is the 15th episode in a series that seeks to demystify programming and assembly language for the 6502 family of 8-bit processors. We're using the Commander X16 as a target, as it has a 65CO2, and is a particularly excellent platform for this learning process. If you haven't seen the previous episodes and need to start from the very beginning, please go back to my channel. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell for notifications while you're there so that you'll know when the next episodes come out and start this playlist from the beginning. So far in this series, we've learned the fundamentals of assembly programming by going through the entire 65CO2 instruction set and examining how each instruction works, and so far learning some basics of handling graphics by working with both Petsky text and graphical tiles. The Vera display adapter for the X16 can configure one of its two layers to be text, tiles, or a monolithic bitmap, where every pixel needs to be allocated in a contiguous segment of VRAM. This is a great option for creating detailed backgrounds, but bitmaps can also be manipulated on the fly. In this episode, we're going to learn how to configure Vera layers to display bitmaps, create and load them into VRAM, and then draw on the bitmap directly during execution. In my earlier episode on tiles, we saw some of the graphics modes available when configuring the Vera. There are two layers, with layer 0 behind layer 1. By default, layer 1 has text that is tied to the basic interpreter, and layer 0 is disabled. Either of them can be configured to be bitmaps instead. Rather than being comprised of separate maps and tile sets, they can reference a single segment of VRAM containing a bitmap that can be interpreted as either 320 or 640 pixels wide. The bitmaps are formatted just like big tiles, but have no limit to the number of rows of pixels other than available VRAM. Each bitmap layer has a fixed color depth, one of the four supported by Vera, and a single palette offset applied to the entire bitmap. Unlike tile layers, bitmaps can't be scrolled, and will be fixed to the upper left corner of the display. This means that it is impossible to display any rows beyond the display height. If you have a bitmap layer that's 320 pixels wide, it's possible that the display is actually wider, meaning that the bitmap will repeat horizontally. You can also make sure that the bitmap is tall enough to take up the space that will be visible. Otherwise, you could end up with garbage at the bottom. However, that can be covered with tiles from a higher layer, or sprites. On the other end, if your display is narrower than your bitmap, it will be cropped to the upper left corner, and you can't scroll to recenter it like you could with a tile map. We've already seen how to use the layer configuration registers to set up tile layers, and we use the same ones to define bitmap layers. In the config register, we don't need to worry about setting the map dimensions or the T256 bit, but you will need to make sure the bitmap mode bit is set at bit 2. Bits 1 and 0 are used for the color depth, just the same as with tile modes. When in bitmap mode, the tile-based register is used to define the starting address of the bitmap in VRAM, which is placed in the tile-based address, requiring a 2 kilobyte alignment, just like a tile set. The tile height bit is unused, but the tile width bit at the low end is used to indicate whether the bitmap is 320 or 640 pixels wide. Keeping it clear uses the default width of 320, which we will see is generally a better option than 640 when VRAM space is in short supply. Finally, since bitmap layers can't scroll, they can use the high horizontal scroll register to set the palette offset. Unlike tile layers, you can't have multiple offsets represented in a single layer. It's effectively a map of one big tile. One BPP layers work a bit differently for bitmaps than they do for tile layers. Instead of text glyphs that can have individual color specifications, set bits in the bitmap will all be rendered in the same color, and clear bits will all be transparent. If the palette offset is zero, then color index one will be used for set bits, which will be white by default. You can then change the palette offset to use index 17, 33, or any other index that comes after a multiple of 16. As we saw earlier, we only have one color to pick for the whole bitmap, so choose carefully. But even with just white on black, you have a capability that can recreate the original Apple Macintosh, or support legacy environments like Geos, which will be part of the X16 ROM. The other three color depths work pretty much the same as they do with tile layers, but there are different constraints to consider. 2BPP gives you four colors, and that is as deep as you can go and still have sufficient VRAM to fill a full 640x480 display. You can fill 320x240 displays with any color depth, 
but at 640 pixels wide, you will need to either constrain the height of the display through scaling, or fill in the bottom with tiles or sprites to hide the inevitable garbage. So even though the Vera appears to be an SVGA display adapter, it simply doesn't have the VRAM to fully accomplish it. You will consume nearly all of your available VRAM after 202 rows of 8 BPP pixels at a width of 640, which means you have a lot to cover up and little remaining VRAM to do it if your display is 480 pixels high. This is why, for anything other than text-based applications, it is generally advisable to stick with scaling the display to 320 by 240, which will look better on interlaced displays anyway, in addition to being a better use of your available VRAM. Palette offsets work pretty much the same way for bitmaps as they do for tiles, except that 1BPP bitmaps require palette offsets too, unlike 1BPP text tiles. Pixels using color index 0 are always transparent for any color depth or offset, while other pixels will be mapped to colors at the current offset. The one exception for bitmaps is that 8BPP bitmaps have a, let's call it a feature, where if you have a non-zero palette offset, color indexes 1 through 15 will be remapped, but 0 is still transparent, and indexes 16 and higher will use the expected 256 color palette mappings. There may be some unique use cases for this behavior, but in general, you want to make sure 8 BPP bitmaps are configured for palette offset 0. Also, as we saw earlier, 1 BPP bitmaps can use only the colors in the 1 column of the palette based on the offset. Now let's look at a case study where we can programmatically draw on a bitmap layer, in this case by drawing a simple vertical line. We're going to assume that there is a 4 BPP bitmap layer that is 320 by 240 that starts a hex 0, 4000 in VRAM. Our subroutine is going to get the color of the line from the value in A, the starting row in X, the length of the line in Y, and then the column index in a global word in RAM. So let's start by allocating a global variable called column that will be used as input, followed by some more variables we are going to use inside the subroutine, which we have labeled drawvert. We start by storing the arguments in A and X into the color and start row variables respectively. As you can see above, start row is a full 16-bit word, so we need to finish initializing that by storing a zero to the upper byte. Then we get into the first green segment of the code, where we initialize the mask variable to have the lower nibble clear, and then we check the low bit of the column to see whether it is odd or even. If it is odd, then the mask and color variables are good to go, so we can branch ahead to at set address. Otherwise, column is even, so we need to modify the upper nibbles of the bytes where we are going to draw the line. So we have a little loop to shift mask to the right and color to the left, both by four bits. Once we get to the red code starting from set address, Mask is set to clear out the target nibble, and the value and color can be ORed in to replace it. At this point, we start building up our starting VRAM address in column by taking the value there and dividing it by 2. This is because we have two pixels in each byte, one in each nibble, so the column index will be twice the byte offset we need for each row. So we do the division by doing a 16-bit shift to the right, letting that low bit we already tested fall off as we don't need it anymore. Then we get into some purple code, where we have a loop to multiply start row by 32. We do this because we effectively need to multiply it by 160, as each row of 320 pixels will be stored in 160 bytes. Shifting to the left by 5 bits will accomplish the multiplication by 32, which we can then add to the value in column in the following green code. To get the full multiplication by 160, we need to further add the value of the original start row times 128. So that means shifting it to the left by two more bits, which we do in the next segment of purple code. Now we need to add that again to column in the green code to the right, just as we did before, but this time we add an additional hex 40 to the upper byte of column to get our final address. This is because our bitmap starts at hex 4000, as we said earlier and now we have the VRAM address of the first pixel we need to modify in column. We go into some black code to set up the Vera address registers for data port 0 to use this address. In the bank register, we know that our VRAM bank is 0, so we just need to set the stride value in the upper nibble. In this case, we want a stride of 160, 
so that each successive access of the port will be for the pixels directly underneath the previous ones. We need to be able to reach each byte from port 0 and then put in the updated pixel colors. So that means we'll need to use data port 1 for writing the updated byte to VRAM, striding along every 160 bytes in sync with port 0. So in the following red code, we set up data port 1 to the same address and stride, then finally get to our drawing loop in the blue code. There we read in a byte from VRAM, clear out the target nibble and anding it with mask, then setting the new color by orying it with the color value. Then we store the updated byte into port 1 and keep going until Y, which still has the length at the beginning of the loop, finally decrements down to 0 and we can return. Well, that code is a good example of how to do drawing and use those bitmap specific stride values. In most cases, you want to just load a static bitmap into VRAM from a file. So our example program will do just that, then modify the palette so that we can use the bitmap layer's palette offset to repeatedly fade the bitmap in and out. It's not terribly practical, but these kinds of effects are something you might want to do in a game so that you can fade into and out of scenes or splash screens. So let's go check out this code in the text editor. We, of course, start with a segment preamble and jumpstart, then some constants, starting with the IRQ RAM vector. We have all the same Vera register addresses and values we've been using in this series, with the addition of an alias for the layer 0 bitmap palette offset register. Then we have some kernel methods, starting with IO init, which is making its first appearance in this series. We'll see how that works soon, but as for the rest, they are all old friends now. We only need to worry about a single Petsky character, the Q key, as that's what we'll use to quit and return to basic. Then we define the VRAM addresses we'll need, starting with hex 04000, which is where we are going to be loading our bitmap. As we are going to use a 320 by 244 BPP bitmap, this will allow it to fit in nicely between the layer 1 text map and the Petsky character set glyphs. We won't be using them in our program, but it's nice to know they'll still be there. Then we have all of our global data, starting with the word where we are going to store the default IRQ vector. Then we have a variable to hold the current palette offset and a counter for ticking down each vsync cycle, with a constant for the number of ticks we use for resetting the counter each time it gets down to zero and we change the palette offset. We will be fading in and out, so we need to change the direction that we are updating the offset, either incrementing while going forward then going in reverse by setting a flag to have the offset start decrementing. Then we have the file names for our bitmap and palette data, with end labels to help the assembler calculate their lengths. Finally, we allocate a 32-byte buffer to hold 16 color values that will represent an entire palette offset. At start, we first disable the video by just zeroing out the video register. Then we set our display scale to 320 by 240 and start configuring layer 0. Storing a 6 into the config register will set the bitmap mode bit, and use 2 for the color depth value, which will give us 4 BPP. Then we put the bitmap VRAM address into the tile base register, leaving the low bit clear to interpret the bitmap as 320 pixels wide. Finally, we zero out the bitmap palette offset so that we'll be at the original colors when we first start. Then we load our bitmap into VRAM at the address we just specified. First, we set the normal default arguments for set LFS, including a 0 and Y, which is required for VRAM loading, so that we can specify a VRAM address in the code, rather than loading into main RAM using the address header in the file. Then we call set name with our bitmap file name, and letting the assembler calculate the length by using the difference between the labels we defined on either end of the string. Then we call load by adding 2 to the VRAM address bank for the argument in A, and storing the lower 16 bits of the VRAM address into X and Y. In the case of our bitmap address, the bank bit is 0, but having a value of 2 in A will tell the kernel to load into VRAM rather than CPU RAM. If we were loading to an address in bank 1, we would have loaded A with 3, and that would also have triggered a VRAM load. When load returns, the whole bitmap will be loaded into VRAM, and the config registers are set to display it but we won't see it yet because the display is still disabled. Before that happens, we want to load the palette into VRAM as well, so we go through the same code that we had for the bitmap, but with the arguments modified to load the palette file name, 
and store the file data to the palette address. But the palette we are loading will only have the 16 colors of the original bitmap, and we want to expand that to have progressively darker offsets in the palette to make our fade effect work. Since we have 12-bit color on the X16, that means each color component is 4 bits, so we can shift each component to the right four times for each color to eventually get to black without making the hues vary too much. To do this, we need to first copy the 16 colors we just read from the file into the 32-byte RAM buffer we allocated earlier. So we set up data port 0 to start at the beginning of the palette with a stride of 1 so that we get every byte. Then we start our copy loop by initializing x to 0 for our loop index. Then in each iteration, we load a byte from VRAM and store it to our buffer, indexed with x. Then we increment x, and once we get up to 32, all 16 colors are copied to the buffer, and we fall out of the loop. Then we start a new loop to create the faded palette offsets. This will take four iterations, so we load y with 4 to use for the loop index, then we set up a nested loop that will index with x, initializing it to 0, as once we get into the loop, we are also going to use x to index back through our RAM buffer. We load up each byte and shift it to the right, then clear out bit 3 so that the low bit from the upper nibble gets thrown out as well. This will have the effect of shifting each nibble to the right independently. Then we store this new value, with 50% less intense values for the color channels, into VRAM, still using data port 0, which will continue to fill out the palette. We increment x, and once we get up to 32, we've shifted every component of color in the buffer and stored it into a new complete palette offset, so we fall out of the inner loop and decrement y. We keep looping to create progressively darker palette offsets until y gets down to 0, and we fall out of the outer loop. Now our bitmap and palette are all completely laid out in VRAM, so we can now enable just layer 0, which will make the bitmap finally appear. We leave layer 1 disabled so that we don't see the text left over from the basic screen. Now we need to get our custom interrupt handler set up, which means we first need to initialize the global variables that our handler is going to use. We want offset to be 0 so that we start out with a bitmap at full intensity, then initialize the counter to its maximum value so that it won't start fading until the counter goes all the way down to 0, then storing 0 to reverse so that we are initially incrementing our offset which makes sense as we just set the offset to zero. Then we do our regular bits of backing up the default IRQ handler and putting our custom handler into the IRQ RAM vector. We start our main loop by waiting for the next interrupt to be handled, then checking our keyboard buffer for Q. If anything else is in there, including nothing, we just branch back to the top of the loop. Once Q is pressed and finally read off the keyboard buffer, we fall out of the loop and restore the default IRQ vector. Then rather than going through the whole process of restoring the default Vera configuration, including the palette, we can just reset Vera by writing a hex 80 to the control register. This will only get us about halfway to where we need to be, so we finish the job with a call to the IO init kernel subroutine. This reinitializes the Vera and a few other things to get the X16 back into the swing of BASIC, which we can then safely return to. All we have left is our custom IRQ handler, which first checks to see if this is a VSync interrupt. If the vsync bit isn't set in the ISR register, we just branch ahead to continue with the default handler. Otherwise, this is a vsync, so we decrement counter and branch ahead to at continue here if counter is not down to zero yet. Once we have finally decremented counter all the way to zero, we go on to reset the counter with the initial value, then check reverse to see which direction we are going to move the offset. If the high bit of reverse is set, we branch ahead to at decrement. Otherwise, we are still going forward, so we just go ahead and increment the offset variable, then load it up and compare it to 4. Once the offset gets up to 4, we know that next time we want to start decrementing the offset. But until then, we just branch ahead to at set offset. Once we are up to 4, we set the high bit of reverse and unconditionally branch ahead to at set offset. If we were already in reverse, then we would have branched to at decrement, where we decrement offset. If we haven't decremented below zero yet, we branch ahead to at set offset. Once we have gone negative, we reset offset to zero, then clear reverse so that we start incrementing the offset again. Finally, once we get to at set offset, 
we simply store the new offset into the bitmap palette offset register using the alias we created earlier. Then we finally arrived at continue, where we just call the default IRQ handler and we are done with the whole program. Of course, that means we are ready to look at the build script. But wait, what's this first line? Oh yeah, those bitmap and palette files need to come from somewhere, namely an image. But mainstream imaging software doesn't simply output X16 bitmaps ready for loading into VRAM. We're going to need to convert an existing standard to get the files we need. So we have this call to Python to run a script called 4bppbitmap.py and pass it brillig.data as an argument. But where did brillig.data come from? Well, that's a raw data bitmap file that we can generate using free software like GIMP. So before we go any further, let's see how we created this file in the first place. In the Lesson 15 subdirectory of the tutorial repo linked in the description, we have the code we just went through as well as a file called brillig.jpg. This is of course a standard JPEG image file, so let's open that right into GIMP. Okay, let's zoom in to get a better look. As you can see, this is already 320 by 240, but it is using full RGB color, which simply won't work. We need to convert this to an indexed palette and get it down to 16 colors, including black. We have some sufficiently dark bits in here already, so we can just remap all the colors to 16 and just make the darkest color that comes out black. If we were missing these dark bits, we'd have to remap to only 15 colors and add black to the beginning of the palette. So to do this in GIMP, we go to the Image menu, go down to Mode, and select Indexed. In this dialog, we have the maximum number of colors set to 16, and selected Normal Floyd Steinberg Dithering to help us achieve the illusion of some in-between colors. We click Convert, and we can see a new dithered 16-color version of our original image. We can see our palette up on the right, and the colors are basically sorted from darkest to lightest. This is very convenient, as we need to replace the darkest color with just pure black. We double-click on the color, and a picker dialog comes up. We just pick black from one of our recent colors, and we see that this is a true all-zero black. We click OK, and we see that color index zero has been completely replaced with black in both the palette and in the image itself. Now our image and palette are fully set, and we are ready to generate our raw data file. In GIMP, we do this by going to the File menu and select Export As. And we get a File Chooser dialog. When we specify a file with the .data extension, this will export to raw data and use a full byte for each pixel to specify the color index. It will also generate an additional file for the palette using 24-bit RGB color values that will have the same file name, but with .pal appended, meaning that our palette will be in brillig.data.pal. If we click Export, it will ask if we want to overwrite the brillig.data that's already there. And we can because it won't actually change the contents of the file. If you wanted to modify the image, you can go ahead and do that and put your own raw bitmap in your local branch of the repo. You could give it a different name too, but you'll have to change the .data file name back in the build script, which we'll go back to again. So now we see where we got brillig.data from, but what about the Python code? Let's go ahead and see that right now. I wrote this little Python script to do the simple conversion from the output of GIMP to the format we need to load into the X16. I've done similar programs in C, which you can find in some of my other repos, like the XCI game engine, but a lot of folks are more comfortable with Python these days, and what we need to do can really be accomplished with a short bit of pretty fast code. First, we import the sys library, which we will need to access the command line argument. Then we go ahead and open that raw data file specified in the first argument to read as a binary file. Then we read the entire file into one big byte array and close the file. Then we create another byte array for the output data, which we initialize with a 2-byte header of just zeros, as our X16 program is just going to ignore it. We then have a loop where we take on the input data 2 bytes at a time, shifting the first byte to the left by 4 bits, and ORing it with the second byte to consolidate two 4-bit color indexes in separate bytes into a single byte and append it to the output array. With all the data converted, we open up the output file, 
which we will hard code with the file name bitmap.bin, as we saw in the assembly code. You will see here that we specify all capital letters, because now we are in the realm of modern Unicode programming languages, and we want the file name to be all caps in the file system. We used all lowercase in the assembly code because of the weird way that Petsky works and how CC65 handles that, by using lowercase letters to specify unshifted characters, as shifting would give you graphical characters. Anyway, once it's open, we write all the output data to the new file and close it. Then we need to convert the palette file, so we open that by appending .pal to the file name in the argument, then loading it into a new input byte array and closing the file. We then create a new output byte array with another 2-byte header. We'll build on this with a new loop that will take the palette input data 3 bytes at a time. The input file is formatted to have a byte for red, then green, then blue, in an intuitive RGB order. As you'll remember, the Vera uses little endian 12-bit RGB values, so we start with the lower byte, which will have the green value in the upper nibble and blue in the lower nibble. So we consolidate the second and third bytes by taking the upper nibbles of each and putting them together in one byte and append that to the output array. Then we take the upper nibble of the first byte and put that into the lower nibble of our next output byte to get our red value. We leave the upper nibble of this new byte clear and append it to the output array. Once we get through the whole palette, we write the output byte array to pal.bin and we're done. So now let's get back to that build script. Now we see how we use that Python script to convert the raw bitmap and palette we created with GIMP, which will generate the files needed by our assembly program, which we will build into bitmap.prg. Let's go do that right now. Let's run build.sh and do a directory listing. And we'll see that bitmap.bin, pal.bin, and bitmap.prg are all built. So let's run the emulator. And we'll maximize it to really appreciate our bitmap. Let's load bitmap.prg and run it. And there's our bitmap, fading in and out just like we expected. You can see it changes pretty quickly, and you can adjust the timing by changing the counter reset value in the init counter constant. But for now, we hit Q to quit, and we're right back to basic. And that's it for this lesson. I hope this gave you a well-rounded understanding of how to work with bitmaps on the Commander X16, and what some of the possibilities may be. I strongly suggest you try modifying both the assembly code and the Python code to try other color depths or create other effects. This will all come in handy once we learn more about how to do new things in later episodes and find ourselves well on our way to being able to create a complete game from the ground up. If you don't want to miss any episodes in the future, make sure you subscribe to my channel and click the bell to get notified when they come out. If this episode taught you anything, please click the like button, and if you have any questions, please put them in the comments and that can influence how future episodes are made. If you can't wait for the videos to go public, become a patron and get access to new videos as soon as possible, just like the folks you see here did on my Patreon page, which you will find linked in the description along with a GitHub repo containing all the materials for this tutorial series. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye bye